Thank you very much for coming to this, uh, to this panel. It's kind of been uh, my uh, baby. Um, I felt it was really important for us to have a retrospective for Xbox Live Indie Games because the service is actually shutting down tomorrow and its lifespan has actually yeah. mirrored indica Indicates 10 years actually very closely. Um, so I thought it would be a good topic. Um, and there's a lot of love for it. Uh, so it's yeah. our, our eulogy, I think, was the yeah. right. I think that's a good <laughs> word. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's one, that's one way you could... Uh, could or uh, what was that? More at <laughs> they could be yeah. a, a, a celebration of what it was. Okay. <laughs> okay, then uh, Shay, can you hit us with the next slide? So, uh, um, Ian, Nathan, do you want to say a bit about your background? Hi. Nope. I don't know. They'll, they'll turn, yeah. Is this working? Okay. Yeah. It's a stick of Hi. Oops. Um, so, I bake pies and. I also make indie games. Um, I did, um, I run Mommy's Best Games. In 2008, we did Weapon of Choice, and then we did Shoot One Up, Explosion Aid, and Game Type on Exploit. My name is Ian Stocker. Um, my company name is Magical Time Bean. It's kind of, I don't like the company name. I picked it because I thought I could get rid of it, but I kept making games under it, and so I'm stuck for the time being with that. Uh, I make I made the Escape Goat series and the Soulcaster series. Uh, my first game was Soulcaster, and it was made in like 2008. I think it came out the end of 2008, something like that. Yeah. Um, I'm Casper Gray. Uh, I'm not a developer. I was the acquisition. Acquisitions manager at IDOS and Square Enix for around about 10 years. So I spent a lot of time looking at Xbox Live Arcade and Xbox Live Indie Games looking for new developers. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to be taking part of a panel to share some insights from Boyd Moultra, the original creator of XNA. Uh, he's provided some great info and other developers who couldn't make it, such as uh, Ben Kane and uh, Tom Stone, have uh, written in and I'll chip in with some of their insights. Yeah, and I'm Kelly Santiago, I was um, co-founder of that game company, so developed on PlayStation Network. We were just talking about though we used um, XNA to prototype uh, Flower. For a long time, we were doing the game development in XNA. Um, and so uh, I watched XBLIG on sort of the other side of it. Um, and uh, having been a part of a company that went through, it was sort of this, uh, part of the, the changing times, right? Where like we had this three game deal with Sony, which was similar to a more traditional like publisher developer relationship just prior to kind of like XBLIG, which just blew it all up. I mean, it gave you direct access to um, publishing to, to a console. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right. Yeah, it's come out okay. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll talk a bit on this one because it's um, mainly information from Boyd. Um, the X, XNA as a uh, development language was always intended to have a democratic storefront that games developed on the, uh, using the language would be available on. So it's something that they planned for from the start. But Boyd and his team, uh, some of whom are mentioned there, um, had to fight very hard internally at Microsoft to make the project a reality. Um, there was a lot of skepticism internally at Microsoft as to whether allowing just anyone, you know, anyone off the street to release a game on a console was something that should even be allowed at all. And um, he spent a long time making that happen. Um, and part of that was developing a peer review system so that developers could review each other's games and approve, approve them for release on the platform, uh, which is something that became a bit contentious later. And it's also important to remember at this time, you know, engines like uh, Unreal were not available for just you know hobby developers, and the App Store, you know, iOS hadn't happened really, so there was no kind of precedent for this type of initiative. Do we want to talk about this a little bit? This era, yeah. First? yeah. So it was. It came out. Uh, it released in November two thousand eight, and just so you know, like Geometry Wars was the end of two thousand five. So that was the start of two people making a game if you, and making lots of money. Let's put it that way, like millions of dollars. And Braid was August 2008. So that was the indie explosion start. But, I mean, it was really, really close to all that, that you could get your hands on an Xbox 360 and then see your own game being made on it. It was incredible. So 
uh, it was, I mean, I can't believe they got it moving like that inside of a big company on, you know, on a console. So, yeah, that was just Geometry Wars was the start. When I, when I saw that, Geometry Wars, and, and I tried to convince my wife, I was like, I think it's possible. I think you could make a game with fewer than 150 people. You know what I mean? Like, so, yeah. Yeah, how, how did you guys both hear about XBLIG and like what got you excited to, or, or make, made you uh, take that leap over to, to publish on it? I'd been in games since 2002 and going to GDC and um, that sort of thing, uh, IndieCade didn't exist yet uh, back in those days, but I uh, got a poster for XNA 1.0 or something <laughs> and I hung it up on my wall and I, I kind of put that there as a challenge to myself for when I had some free time to make a game, something I've always wanted to do, um, probably like most of the people here. and. Uh, yeah, when I finally got a project canceled out from under me uh, and I had a bunch of free time, I decided I'd go to the coffee shop and work on it. It was really unprecedented, just to describe for people who don't know how XBlig works. So Xbox Live Indie Games was like the platform you could publish to, and it was like the distribution on the Xbox. Um, but XNA was the framework. It was built on .NET, so you could use C Sharp. And both of these things were astonishing for the time because XNA was cross-platform with Xbox 360 and the PC. You could develop entirely. My first game I just built on the PC and then like got my login for 100 bucks to like send it over Wi-Fi to the 360 and test it there. And it pretty much just worked. Like I had to do some performance stuff. <laughs> but um, no dev kit, no spending thousands of dollars, no um, you know getting developer status from Microsoft. You could just do it. Uh, so that was like an incredible thing, and like making a console game in particular was, in my mind, such a prestigious thing because it kind of mm -hmm. anyone could produce for the PC at the time. But like, oh, you're on Xbox, that's like a huge deal. Mm -hmm. It's worth remembering that at that time, um, I think Steam was only seeing like dozens of releases every month or every, every year even. So there wasn't really an indie scene there on mm -hmm. PC. There wasn't a clear kind of where the indies go. That was, mm. I mean, that was around. Like, oh, I don't know, PC might be dead. Yeah. You know, 2007, 2008, they were like, oh, I don't know about this. Like, I, you know, that was, Half-Life 2 only just came out a little, you know, before, before that. So mm -hmm. it was crazy. I think it was, um, what I saw too was that excitement um, as sort of our generation of uh, game developers being the, like, we fell in love with games in the living room for the most part. Um, so it was about having that access to to share experiences with other people in the way that like we loved them and like really yeah really enjoyed them when we were growing up. When when I saw Weapon of Choice running for the first time, and I ran, I developed that game on a CRT TV. <laughs> I'll tell you what, let's get the next slide up since you got Weapon of Choice. <laughs> oh right, <laughs> hanging out and talking the whole time. Um, I would just, I would like shed a tear for just seeing it run on a CRT. It was so yeah. beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. So magical. <laughs> just magic, you know what I mean? To run it's your so own magic. game on a console. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know when that'll die or go away, right? Like, <laughs> are, you know, 10 year olds in 20 years from now not going to care about consoles? Maybe. Right. I don't know. But at the, we, yeah, yeah, at the time it was great. And def definitely uh, as a, someone on the publisher side of that period, you know, developers would say to me, you know, it's really important to be on console because it, that's you know, how I can prove to kind of my family that I, what I'm doing is real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who here wants, like, wants to have a game on a console or do you guys care about that anymore? Yeah, is that still a fascination <laughs> that, with anybody like, else? Okay, what about uh, like PC, computer? More interested in that, mobile? Well, oh, Two okay. hands up, it's yeah. kind of like well, even, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we were also talking about time. I mean, you're touching on like a time when it, w it was just less um, uh, diverse. The whole ecosystem. There were like very narrow set of channels and, and opportunities to to reach players. Yeah. For sure. Um, so here we have, oh. you know, some of the early games on the system. Uh, the Xbox Live Indie Games were introduced with the uh, what was called back then the new Xbox experience, which is about. 10 dashboard updates ago from Microsoft uh, there on the right. And um, two of uh, Nathan's games are shown here on the left. Um, and then some of the other early uh, strong games were uh, games like uh, Breath of Death and Cthulhu Saves the World from Z-Boyd Games. And also something we'll touch on uh, on the next slide as well is 
the proliferation of Minecraft, Minecraft clones. Mm -hmm. So, Weapon Choice was a launch title with a game called um, uh, Word Soup. Does anybody remember that one? Hunter, you remember that one? I mean, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that was by two British guys, and it was really fun. And but we got dashboard space for our game. Like it was a slot. Like there was, you know, box games, arcade games, and then Word Super and Weapon of Choice got a little dashboard space, and it was incredible. And um, I'll go ahead and share this one just so, so I get it out there. So that was November, and Microsoft invited us out to a launch party, and Sean Baby was there, and it was a fun time. Yes, we had a launch party for Community Games. It was one that was called Community Games. It was really cool, and Microsoft really supported it, and it was at a cool hip club. Um, anyway, so that launched around Thanksgiving time, and the terror was um, they were not giving real-time sales data. Okay, so real-time sales data didn't come out until March after the November. So we were like, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share this one real quick just so everybody can enjoy this insane story. Biology Battle was a game made in, um, I wanna say, the Philippines, and by a real smart group, I think it was called Nova, Nova Leaf. So this guy worked out a way, and his team worked out a way to do um, leaderboards. And so he was getting, his game was out too, and no one knew any numbers. And we were all terrified about what are the numbers? Like, how are we doing? And Weapon of Choice was the top, you know, $5. And some people were, were all like, oh, we should be able to spend, you know, charge more for our games back then. So, um, and their game was a $5 game too. And, I, and he was pushing out numbers, like, in terms of his leaderboards that I think it was saying, like, he's like, oh, we've got, we have at least 60,000 or 90,000 owners. And he was, like, lower down on the list because all we had to go by was a relative list. There was no numbers or anything. So we're, I was like, Okay, I don't, know, I don't know if I believe this, but and we're above that. And we're like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. He had a bug in his code. <laughs> oh. That was re-registering. He was effectively registering plays, I, I believe, the way the code was working. So anytime anyone was playing and registering, he was hitting plays, and it was like, we've got 100,000 people. Oh my gosh. And um, so when March came around, it was some deep soul searching because the numbers were much lower than we thought. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm not sure if we touch on it in the in the next slide or not, but yeah, that there was no um, way of knowing uh, publicly like uh, the sales mm. of different games, and you had Gamma Sutra doing their sort of like guesstimates based on yeah. polling, <laughs> like at leaderboards, pretty much tra yeah, trying to reverse engineer the leaderboards. Yeah, because especially I mean, X and A games weren't initially able to access the actual leaderboards. They have no properly. leaderboards. It had, to, had to be. So we yeah. had peer-to-peer -peer <laughs> leaderboards. Anybody do that? You remember that one? Like, um, so I had a guy going by the name Spin Doctor, and he was cool, and like he shared around some code. And so I did not do it on Shoot One Up, but when Explosion Aid came out in October 2010, by the way, hey, seven years. That was like, um, yeah, seven years of your birthday for that game. Um, so he had this really cool peer-to-peer -peer kind of system. And so what you do is it would share any data for a game's leaderboards with anyone currently playing the game. So it basically played, it played a game with itself where it just shared leaderboard data as it could. So you got these bubbles of score pockets. And so we would just leave on our Xboxes and hope that it shared. I always had my game on for like months there for a while to make sure people had leaderboards, that we were our own servers for a while. But yeah, that was the Xbox Live had real, real leaderboards and we did not have support. I'm just amazed that an Xbox 360 was able to run continuously that long without it didn't. melting. It didn't. We had to check it about every couple of days. <laughs> uh, so yeah, what were some of the what, some other challenges? Maybe you you not chimed in on like the uh, early stage, or was there any frustration, pain points, writing on the wall? Uh, so yeah, like we never really communicated directly with Microsoft. We knew a few people like kind of involved with the Xblig team, but they were kind of like this. Um, deity that could favor you if they gave you dashboard placement, which would happen randomly. You'd wake up and check your numbers for the previous day, and it's like, instead of three, you'd be 490. Uh, or you'd find that they'd done a dashboard update, and now you're four levels deep from the main menu instead of three, and your sales are zero. So there were a lot of things like that where you kind of felt at the whims of the gods. Uh, one other thing, you mentioned the pricing and like the premium thing. So you could be one, three, or five dollars. Uh, we wanted $10 at launch. <laughs> like we thought, well, we should be allowed to have $10 games. 
all my games were three dollars. I felt like it was kind of like, and that was considered the premium thing at the time. Was the three dollar game? Um, the one dollar was like the McDouble, and the three dollar would be like the um, the Arch Deluxe or whatever. And uh, I thought my game was was sophisticated enough it could command three dollars in this marketplace. But I was wrong. Uh, when I lowered it to a dollar after surveying it, and I'm like, wow, this is the dollar store of games. People are looking through here and. When they see a game, I'm putting myself into the mind of like the customer. If they see a three dollar game, that's like when you go to the arcade. Uh, for those of you who remember arcades, and there's like the one dollar game. That's not the twenty five cent game. But this one's asking for four quarters to even try it. Like how dare they? And that that was me asking for three dollars for my game. Uh, and so when I lowered it to a dollar. Uh, revenue went up by two and a half times, something like that, even with the lower price. So sales went up like 10 times. Uh, so yeah, I've learned a bit about pricing, I guess, as well. And expectations, right? Like, what was the sense of, um, of the fact that, I mean, there were independently developed games on Xbox Live Arcade, but then you had this section called Indie Games, and it was the dollar store, like, it was that, uh, yeah, I don't know if there, if there was there like conversations in the community or like, could we name this something else? Do we have a branding problem here? Or? We knew we were never going to be at the level of prestige of like Xbox Live Arcade. And I don't think a lot of us wanted to have to go through the amount of red tape that they had to go through. Um, so we could kind of glide under the radar for the most part and do our own thing. We knew we weren't going to make like a ton of money there either. It was more of a hobbyist platform, uh, and I was totally not above charging a dollar for my game. I was like, okay, cool. Like whatever makes me the most money. If it's five cents, then it's five cents. But um, yeah, there, we wanted leaderboards. We wanted achievements. And what else did we want? Want it now? Legalize it. I don't know. <laughs> what, um, we never got those things. Like, yeah. There, there were um, people that like wouldn't play our games. Like I'd see on the forums, it'd be like. Why would I play this game where I'm not going to get any gamer score whatsoever yeah. out of it? That was a huge deal. Like the achievements yeah. would have really pushed it akin to like not allowing trader trading cards or something on Steam, you know. Um, but in terms of like branding, they called us the Creators Club. Yeah. Like that's cute, guys. Go make your games. I mean, that's a branding problem. That's dumb, you know. Yeah. Um, it did not take it seriously. It didn't seem like it. I wonder how much that did to like. I mean, because they're still, we're still kind of suffering with the sort of indie ghetto of, of storefronts yeah, or, like, or that association with if it's indie, that means it's raw or lower quality or those kind it, of associations. I talk to things. regular gamers, regular people, and, and they, they feel like that. They're like, oh, indie games, huh? Mm -hmm. You know, they kind of look at you funny now. And, yeah. And whenever you're making a game like in that store, like even though it was like the dollar store, you're still kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> You know, you kind of do this, and you're like, no, 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 my game's really good. Trust me on this. Yeah. You, you know, come on in. So it's hard. You have to get over that impression that it's not worth their time. You know, the whole price versus your time kind of thing. When you price it high, oh, they must be really serious, you know. Mm -hmm. And when you say it's a dollar, it can go either way. I'll go, oh, it's a great bargain. Oh, I don't know, fuck. I only paid a dollar for it. Who cares? Mm -hmm. you know? Were there signs early on of what kind of games were more successful in the All in right, the let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> It leads yeah. into the next thing. Okay. It segues yeah, no, do, into, do no, yeah, I think, then slide. maturity, right? Yeah. 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 And okay. so, yeah, much before we go into that, I was going to say um, one of the things that uh, Kathy at Indie Gamer Chick let me know is that um, there was a period internally at Microsoft, and Microsoft were just thinking of killing off Indie Gate, the XBLIG, um, because the amount of money being generated from Microsoft was you know, tiny. And all the trends at the time in console gaming were towards bigger AAA games. You know, certainly working at IDOS at the time, we were just doing bigger and bigger projects. You know, there was, even XBLA, there was very little interest internally. Um, but the thing that really made the executives at Microsoft sit up and notice is when we had to cut a seven-figure check for a Minecraft clone. You know, uh, and suddenly they're like, "Wait a sec, this isn't even XBLA. This is on Xbox." indie games, how the hell are we writing out this kind of money to someone? Uh, and that made people them like realize that maybe we should keep it going. And actually, over time, what happened was, is that, that picture of the top is, I think, quite a recent one of the most popular games ever, and all of the top five are Minecraft-type games. Yeah, I mean, so, um, I think I got the list in a decent consecutive order. So what would happen was, like, early on, 
Um, it was such an odd microcosmic marketplace um, of nonsense. Like we were making all our regular games that we wanted to see on a console, and then along came somebody and they made like a controller vibrating game. And you're like, I don't know if that's a game. We started arguing about it, and there was massage games that were really seedy and weird. Like you could make. Yeah, yeah. So there, we went through these phases. Of like every three or six months, there would be a new, a new um, kind of uh, style. There was, there was. Uh, I'll read them on the list. There was like app games, non games. Or do they, should they be on their controller vibrating games? And then Microsoft said the avatar could be used in an indie game, which was a big deal. It actually contributed into the Minecraft stuff. But like, so there was avatar games. So everybody started just spewing those out. And then there was the Minecraft clones, which was the biggest money market, money making thing, obviously. But then there was also dating games. There was a big kind of weird thing of having these, I don't know, sex on the cover, kind of boobs on the cover dating games. And then there was scare games. There was a lot of scare kind of weird app non-games there. We went through these weird phases. I mean, we, like all marketplaces, we ended up settling on like Minecraft clones, but. I mean, it was just, it was yeah. so weird that to have these full-sized waves pass through a marketplace. Mm -hmm. Like now, everything's so diverse, it's hard to get a ripple out of the marketplace. And when we were there, you would feel the entire, everything would shift around you, and then you would question your own reality, and you'd be like, maybe I should start making boob games. I don't know. <laughs> like, maybe I should yeah. put vibration in my game. No, like. So I mean, like, I don't know. <laughs> it was crazy, and that would, I mean, they would last for a while. You know, it wasn't yeah. so evened out and homogenous and big. Like, the marketplace is weirdly effective and possible to make money in, and yet small. That was the kind of the magic of it. And also, kind of um, presaging the similar things that would happen on iOS. You know, there's an open marketplace with things like, you know, the kind of Flappy Bird clones or Crossy Road. And everyone piling into whatever the genre of the week was. And that's kind of the behavior we were already seeing on XBLIG before that. Uh, how were they in um, community management? Like, was it, uh, did you feel like they were listening? Was there active management? Was it. So, Kathleen Lord Sanders. Lord of the Flies? I don't know. <laughs> Kathleen Sanders was, was great, and she was our pushback against Microsoft internally, as far as we could tell. Um, so I remember complaining to Eurogamer and getting some things to happen at one point, like getting a story and just saying, this isn't right. You know what I mean? Like they're not treating us right. And then the, getting that published getting. in a, in press mm -hmm. and the next update, we would not hear anything. And then the dashboard would change mm -hmm. and things would be better sometimes. Um, so it was a black box, except for on the community forums, we, there was some community managers, and some of them were, were trying really hard for helping out the developers. Um, but I, I will just say like also, again, in terms of having a small space, the community forums was r pretty great, and the, the peer review system was really interesting. I mean, that was a big part of like being with other developers and playing their games and giving them yeah. feedback and, um, you were holding back other people from business. It was the weirdest thing ever. Um, it was like, you know that analogy of like, you have a cake and your friend cuts the cake and you choose what size it is? I mean, that was almost like that. You were like helping them out in peer review. And then there was some dirty stuff, helping, you know, play my game and, you know, play yours. But um, yeah, the forums were really, I, I mean, I met Ian through the forums. He's an okay guy. <laughs> yeah, Ian, do you want to say a bit about, um yeah, press and you know, Kathy into Gamer Chick and how you know, her picking up on Escape Girl and stuff like that. Yeah, um, I was always coming from the position of like, I didn't have super high expectations for either myself, my games, for um, the system like XBlig. And when the media would mention um, like one of my games and liked it, it they kind of approached it as uh, that they found something amazing they fished out of the gutter. I loved digging into peer review and play testing games and giving people feedback and just like just seeing raw stuff and then seeing it getting shaped into really exciting things. There was, I mean, I, there was lots of great games on there. We, whenever it makes sense, we want to 
go down our list of favorite games at some point too <laughs> that aren't ours. <laughs> <laughs> On the next slide, there you have a point about um, Overcooked and yeah, like how there series. were uh, there are a number of games. I mean, um, yeah. that that triple A games, you know, sp uh, even would speak about like getting inspired mm. by something yeah. through those channels. It's a, I, it's good. I think it's a good illustration of that thing where sometimes people really can't look beyond the surface. It's because if you look up there, you look at the uh, box art for Minor Dig Deep, that's probably not going to go down in history as one of the greatest uh, <laughs> pieces of box art ever. And I think that, that Wait, was one of yeah, the... Okay, now you have to go back and show... Okay, there we go. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it's like... Um... What is that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the helmet. The helmet. Yeah. Okay, I can... <laughs> Ariel. So, the so... best logo ever. Like, just look at that font. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe and I think that, it was that kind of thing that made people see it as a ghetto and it, you know this area of all oh, these really cheap games that you know I really don't need to pay attention to. And I think that's how that's what led a lot of people to you know kind of pass over the area. I think maybe that's uh, you know with hindsight you'd say, oh, if I'd been encouraged more more polish to be put into you know kind of front front of the store, or make front. a uniform template or yeah. something. Just be like so we on the forums people would. Um, just work hard about guys make better box art. We, I mean, we would coach <laughs> each other. We're just like, and you know, and it's weird to like trust anybody. You're just like, I know what I'm doing. You're just the same as me. You know what I mean? And some, and you have to like say, well, maybe some people have better skills than others. And people would just say, they would link to things and show them screenshots. Just like trust us, and you know, trust me on this. You got to do better box art. Look at these kind of look at how you're doing box art here, and look at successful games. Try harder. So, I mean, people are trying to help each other. We're like writing dissertations. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Okay, so before we move on to the, the decline of Xbox Live Indie Games, uh, yeah, do you want to run down your top three or four games? Well, I love Explosion Aid because it reminds me of Metal Warriors for Super Nintendo, which uh, not many people know about, but it's cool. Um, I don't know, there's a game that I always bring up because uh, nobody's really heard of it and um, I thought it was really inventive. It's called Coral's Curse. And you play as a woman who's half snake, like a naga, and use the two sticks to wrap her tail around things because you can't jump or anything. And there are these various like bricks and platforms you can crawl around. Uh, and I don't know, I just love the aesthetic of it and the execution of it. Um, here you go. Okay, so Hunter made in the audience there made the game called In the Pit, and that came out. What, what year was that? Two thousand nine. It was a launch title. It was a, title. <laughs> it was a sound only game, and you were oh, in yeah. a pit with a giant monster, and it used vibration and sound for you to navigate around it and to stop this monster. That's pretty cool. So that was a cool game. Um, Prismatic Solid was a shoot 'em up made by a Japanese dude, and it took the, um, the idea of uh, instancing 3D objects and went nuts with it. And he got lighting effects on 3D instance objects. So you would have this huge field of high poly spheres, and then when things exploded, light lighting would come off and like, you know, all these particles were lighting up this huge field. It was insane. Like, and they, he would, it was like a tech demo, but, but a shoot 'em up the, the title screen was doing all this warping with tons of, um, Cubes and shapes. It was gorgeous. It's prismatic solid. It's really cool. Um, and it had a decent weapon system. Protect Me Night was yeah. another Japanese game. Very cool. It had like um, single screen, amazing cute pixel art. It was made by uh, Yuzo Kashira. And, and he was a musician, right? Yeah, and his company was called Ancient. But um, the quality level was a Nest title. It was just so good. I mean, it was just wonderful quality. All the way through to the ending and the little characters dance and you had the whole story. <laughs> I love that game. It was a fantastic job. Um, and then also, uh, um, okay, there was another one. It was not super high quality, but um, I don't even, it did not have a pronounceable title. It was a diamond shape with a dash and maybe a thumb or something. Mm. But it was this weird All thing right. about you have these, I mean, very weird, cool, and freaky. Like, you have these little creatures that come out of this tree, and you have to push them in the ground so they grow, and then they come out, and you have to negotiate them into this tree rocket. Extremely weird, but really cool. And then um, 
this other weird game called Soulcaster was really good. So <laughs> you just giving me an idea for a panel where people have to just describe games. <laughs> uh, no, you have to guess what they are. Well, oh yeah, it's a great game. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, have, I have one last one. Uh, I have to give oh. a shout out to Hidden in Plain Sight. I was just going to do that. I was like, it hasn't been mentioned yet. Yeah, Adam Sprague. Sprague. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it remains, uh, in my mind, the best local party game on Xplig and probably my favorite deception game like oh. at all. Yeah. Ian coached me on moves about like you make sounds accidentally when you're using the sticks and you have to be quiet while you're doing Yeah, so it's one yeah, where you, you have use to the right guess. stick to yeah, pretend you're, you're moving so you're clicking a little bit. Yeah, the oh, idea nice. is you you see all the you see all all of you on the screen along with uh NPCs and each mini game is a variation of basically trying to figure out which one is your friend instead of the NPC. Um but yeah, Truly, but I, it, when you're saying it shut down, it made me think like, oh God, I gotta remember to like make sure that's downloaded yeah. before they shut the. I whole think it's thing. on yeah. PC, right? I mean, it, it should I be think on it PC. Might be, yeah. yeah. Yeah, about the living room. Okay. <laughs> um, Shay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a dotage, old age, um, the decline and fall of XBLA, um, sorry, of Xbox Live indie games, I should say. Um, <laughs> We'll get into the reasons, and this is something where Tom Stone of Digital DNA Games uh, has written a Game of Sutra article you can check out as well, where he digs into some some of the reasons he felt the platform declined. Um, since we've also got a couple, we've got a couple of games up there. I should mention um, they're a couple of my favourites. Uh, our little uh, Tiny Atlantis, I think it is. Um, our little Atlantis was done by a guy called Robert Swan. Um, I'm on a forum and I heard about it from him there, so I picked it up. It's a lovely little puzzle game where you're on an island that slowly floods. Um, but I found out from him recently, it actually sold a total of 12 copies. So I feel like I'm coming to some really exclusive club. Yeah. Um, but one of the things about that is, it highlights the problem with visibility there was with, with those games. Is that even games that were very good, just didn't get much visibility. And thankfully, some other games such as uh, Wizorb, uh, which is another one of my favorites, and Flotilla have made the jump to PC. A lot of, lot of the, the games of higher production values were able to move to Steam. Um, I'll let you guys jump in in a sec. But um, personally, I think you're looking from the outside, some of the larger in, uh, industry factors that were at play were that um, the, you know, the app stores on mobile were beginning to rise and they were taking attention and creators away from, from the platform. Um, Microsoft had also, you know, well, Boyd had always visualized XNA as this language that democratized game development. But obviously what happened is the existing engines were forced into a price war eventually and now Unity and Unreal are both available cheaply. You know, so interest in C-sharp declined. And then, you know, what's interesting is that um, other platforms adopted the kind of peer review sort of systems, you know, that um, indie games had um, had pioneered, so things like Steam Greenlight and you know the App Store, where kind of very very low create low curation level stores. So, yeah, if you guys want to talk about um, what kind of turned you off the platform, when did you when did you decide to stop developing for for the platform, and you, what was the last game you did? Or did you have any games you didn't you were going to release and then didn't? Uh, I knew that I was going to make another Escape Goat game, and I knew when I was making it that it wasn't going to be on Xplig because I knew that like its time had passed. That uh, I wanted to make it bigger, and I was going to be working with someone else as like another mouth to feed, and um, maybe some of the tech would be beyond what the 360 could do. But it was mostly about the um, the marketplace, and I knew that it wasn't going to be able to make back the money because I this was when I was like, this is a full time thing for me. This is now my sole source of income. Uh, and I don't think you can go publish a game on Xplig or you couldn't saying like this is gonna you know, set me up for the next year and uh, make up for the amount of time. Because uh, I had done all my games leading up to that in under a year each and this one I knew would take like a little longer than that. So it just was a matter of economics. So 2010, 2011, um, Microsoft would update their dashboard every six months and potentially destroy your sales. Like, it was insane. And to the point that the, the really terrible update um, was around uh, November like 2011, and um, they did an update where they hid the game's label behind a 
girl in a hoodie and it was just labeled game type and all the games in the entire service were behind that label even arcade games were in there and that I couldn't believe my mind you know it was just insane so I made a game called game type and it used that hoodie girl as the game and I recreated that idiotic dashboard and you had to navigate the so I was trying to teach people how to get through the dashboard to find the games and then when you found that tile, labeled game type, you clicked on it and it turned into a shoot 'em up I like shoot 'em ups a lot. So you were playing a shoot 'em up, but the entire time you were navigating the dashboard, and this is real, like it was wall to wall ads. It's just like solid ads, it's just like boxes and boxes of, you know, go do some movies, play some music. Oh, there's some games over here. But like it did, did that. And so in game type, the game, you ended up going into the shoot 'em up and playing and fighting the ads. So you killed the ads in the game. Um, it was gone. Like it was, the magic was snuffed out of it and strangled. So that just reminds me that that was our way of communicating with Microsoft was through these like <laughs> political. Uh, Protest games. That was one way, and I think they took note. They actually fixed yeah, things changed, after yeah, that. You can take all the credit for that, actually. Um, <laughs> although I play tested yeah. that, so a little bit. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, then fifty-fifty, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, like one of the things I got to be a little bit involved with, that I'll, I'll also take credit for, even though uh, Robert Boyd did 98% of the work, um, it was my idea. Uh, and that was to do, <laughs> we called it, he even came up with a name for it, which was the Indie Games uh, Uprising. And this was like, um, they ended up doing a couple of these, but this was in response to a horrible, it might have been that horrible dashboard update or a different one. Uh, where like a dozen or so of us pooled together to make a like kind of a bundle, even though you couldn't buy all of our, our, yeah, you couldn't buy all the games together like officially, but we agreed to support one another. We had a website for the event, and uh, Microsoft did notice because they silently, without telling any of us, uh, created a little like dashboard widget for that event, and we all like benefited heavily. And the people who didn't take part in that uh, were really resentful of us. So, yeah. <laughs> How, how, crazy, how crazy is it for the company to operate that way? I guess when you have a company as big as Microsoft, it's so weird to have like subterfuge and no communication and then things secretly showing up and people angry internally, but you don't know. <laughs> like, I don't think they wanted um, to be like directly accountable for a lot of this stuff. That's why yeah. they had us review one another's games uh, specifically. And there was like this warning plate in front of all the games. Saying, oh yeah. yeah Microsoft has not even looked at these games. We have no <laughs> idea. Uh, have you no cannot, idea. no matter what you see from here on out, <laughs> do not blame us. Unless uh, it's cool. Yeah. You know, then yeah. They will take the credit. They yeah. will take the credit. Yeah. No. We yeah. should uh, move into talking about afterlife and like what you see as the legacy because yeah. the next slide. And just a final, final bit on that point. It's really interesting that it was a platform which was marked by this inter-developer, you know, developer-to-developer communication, which was one of its strengths, but also the peer review system eventually broke down because people would, you were afraid, you know, I saw people like Tom saying that, you know, he was afraid to criticize anyone's game because he knew that developer would then block his game. So it became mutual back scratching. And that's one of the things that kind of led to a lot of games that maybe shouldn't have got through getting through late in the life cycle. Um, but yeah, let's talk a bit about the, what comes after um, indie games and, you know, uh, do communities exist with a similar flavor or is it something that was of its time and has passed? Um, we'll talk about what some of the key developers on the platform uh, went on to next. So, yeah, Nathan? Cool. You liked our old games, but I'd like to tell you about our new product. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I got to make a Serious Sam game for a while. That was really fun. It was called Serious Sam Double D and Double D XXL. Um, that was through Devolver. And that was because um, we made cool games on Xbox Live Indie Games, and Devolver noticed, and they played our games, and they thought they were fun. So, like, who is it? Harry Dean Stanton? Somebody says, like, they always used their current acting job as a pitch for their next job. So do the absolute best job you can on every game you make, because people, people notice. You don't even notice when they noticed. So I did a serious hand game there for a while, and... Um, that was on Steam, and we put it on XBLA, but that was because of Xbox Live Indie Games. 
Um, my personal legacy from all of this is that I still use XNA. I used it this morning. I've used it uh, ever since my first game, and I even have some lines of code in my current project that go back to Soulcaster 1. Uh, and they're all bad, but they pop up from time to time, usually commented out. Uh, but I just love the uh, platform. I love developing in Visual Studio directly, and I love having the control. It's like kind of just the right amount of library versus engine stuff where um, it doesn't try and do too many things. Like I don't need a, a physics engine or anything like that. But handling 2D sprite drawing with hardware acceleration, like I'm really thankful to have that uh, handled under the hood and not have to like draw index primitives and stuff like I did with Direct3D before. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was never going to be able to make a game like that. So I have stuck with XNA, and I plan to keep sticking with it. I don't know really what the future of it is. Uh, it's still XNA 4. Mono last. game? Yeah, there is mono game. FNA? And uh, yeah, my games have used both of those. And so it's cool. There is the community, since there are some really high-profile XNA games still being supported and ported and developed, um, there, there is some more life in XNA overall.